Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we are celebrating Connecticut's comeback. We've just come off a transformative legislative session and transformative budget that reflects the progressive values of our administration while also being fiscally responsible. The strong bipartisan support in both chambers is testament to Governor Lamont's leadership and his commitment to working together with all our partners on both sides of the aisle to achieve shared goals. Our budget contains a tax cut to tens of thousands of working Connecticut families and does not contain any tax increases. This is a good, strong, balanced budget. It shows what we can do in Connecticut when we work together, grounded in values of fairness and opportunity for all. This is the cornerstone of the Connecticut comeback, addressing the impacts of the pandemic, prioritizing equity, and keeping our fiscal house in order. This has been a historic session for women and girls in Connecticut with strong bipartisan majorities. We passed the legislative recommendations of the Governor's Council on Women and Girls. And these initiatives break down barriers that have historically kept women and working parents from running for office and increases the representation and diversity on state boards and commissions. Our budget contains record levels of investment in child care, education, and in health care. And this investment will aid thousands of Connecticut families. We've also provided unprecedented funding to take on the epidemics of opioids, domestic and family violence, and to address mental health. So I am uh, very honored to introduce our governor, Ned Lamont. Hey, thanks, Susan. Well said. And um, even though we have the lowest uh, seven-day uh, COVID infection rate since we started testing well over um, a year ago, or we're doing this remotely, um, Max says many people prefer to stay close to home after a very, very busy three days, which I understand. But I think it's worth noting a few things about this budget and where we are. Uh, remember that it was seven short years ago that a senior um, administration official here in Connecticut said that we are, quote, in a state of permanent fiscal paralysis. Permanent fiscal paralysis, he said. Uh, there was a sense that uh, Connecticut was having a hard time governing itself. We are um, ripped apart by uh, a partisan polarization, couldn't figure out the budget. Um, so I gave a call over the last uh, 24 hours to um, President of the Senate Martin Looney, um, Kevin Kelly, uh, Matt Ritter, Speaker of the House, Vin Candelora, the leaders of the House and the Senate, a shout out to the appropriations and finance chairs and all the members of the legislature because we had a budget that was passed on time in balance without tax increases, with strong, strong bipartisan support. And I was really happy, uh, Marty, to see that vote go up uh, at a reasonable hour last night. I think Susan was happy as well, uh, just to show that uh, in the normal course of business, what we're able to accomplish. And for that, um, a big thanks to all the members of the legislature. Easy to sit it out, easy to say, uh, this is not spending enough money as I want here, or uh, this, uh, fee over here sounds like a tax. I'm not going to support it. People came together and said, this is a budget that's in the best interest of the state from a broad cross section of legislators. I want to say, um, when it comes to timing, I know I'm a little fixated on that, but it's really important that here we are on time, June 9th, we got a budget in place. I'll be able to sign that in a week or two. And uh, what that means to superintendents of schools who now know what their budget can be. They're planning right now, not just for the uh, summer learning camps, but for the new school year. Uh, teacher notices are going out. Your job is in place. We need you back. It allows us to get back to a normal course of business. 
and to plan accordingly. Uh, I know how important um, an increase of municipal aid was, and having that on time for all of our different mayors and um, first selectmen out there, allow them to plan accordingly and put in budget, put in place a budget for next year, starting a few weeks, you know, from now that lets them um, do this on an efficient and uh, way. And by the way, with a significant increase in um, funding and big increases in the grand list with the number of people moving into town, uh, with the number of new uh, you know, business and uh, household startups, um, I think you're going to see um, holding the line or even reducing of property taxes and property tax rates. I think a really good news as we try and bring our um, towns and cities uh, back to life. We talked about that a little bit. Uh, I just wanted to talk about some other pieces of this um, budget that was passed uh, on a bipartisan basis that you don't hear as much about but I think people will understand how important it is um, many years in the future. I think the Senate last night passed uh, the broadband bill. And as I mentioned uh, yesterday, we're still um, you know, negotiating funding for IT, uh, information technology. And I know uh, broadband um, sounds like, well, it's a nice to have, um, uh, help, uh, maybe allows me to do more Amazon. I think we found out, first of all, uh, after COVID, how important broadband for everybody is. Uh, I think you know, in terms of our IT consolidation and our um, uh, MyCT, easier to start a business online, a lot less red tape. I think you understand by uh, visiting, um, not having to visit Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, how much easier it is to do some of these processes uh, online saves you an awful lot of time. And, uh, you know, Josh was just reminding me what the next stage is. We're really focused on people. We're really focused on, for example, the Department of Social Services, where with IT upgrades and uh, MyCT, that means that single parent, that single mom on one stop, either in person or online, you'd be able to get food and food stamps as necessary, health care and Medicaid as necessary, care for kids and daycare as necessary. And I just want to remind people, technology is not about taking somebody's job. It's about providing a better level of customer service for people. And I think we save that single mom an awful lot of time there and maybe in many cases saving her job. Uh, another one I was reminded of, it has what's it called? The Climate Change Adaptation Bill. Eh, it sounds harmless, um, but then you think about what are the investments we're making? What are we allowing municipalities to do? What are we allowing the Green Bank to do when it comes to resilience? What does resilience mean? I, I was asking. Well, you were reminded of uh, Hurricane Sandy, and you know what resilience isn't. That's when you don't have um, the flood protection and things are overwhelmed. It can overwhelm our electric grid and be uh, an incredible, not nuisance, but catastrophe. That's what resilience is. I know there's a tendency, let's not worry about it until we have to. Now is the time to be uh, making that enormous difference. And I was at 101 College, a new building startup in uh, New Haven the other day. And uh, I was impressed what we're doing there. And it's a major healthcare facility and hundreds of thousands of um, people working there, uh, solving cancer, by the way, a place where Connecticut has an enormous advantage really good paying union jobs there to build a facility like that. And then I was reminded that that facility is okay, located right down the street from a union station, and there's a lot of development there in and around transportation. And uh, this is my point. It was also located uh, uh, not too far from Water Street, so-called because that was a region that's much likely subject to flooding, most, much more likely to environmental risk, and 101 College Street happens because we deal with adaptation and resilience and protecting ourselves from the risks and rising tides um, coming out of uh, climate change. These are not the type of issues that necessarily get you the headlines in the paper, but the type of long-term investments uh, we made on a bipartisan basis, thanks to the legislature that stood up over the last uh, couple of weeks. Look, we got some work to do. Um, there's no question about it. Um, Melissa's working with appropriations and legislative chairs on what they call implementers and the bond bill. Um, 
I just want to make sure that what we do, we do in a responsible way where we continue to earn the trust and confidence of the taxpayers of Connecticut. Make sure that what we do, we paid for in an appropriate way over the next two years and over the next 10 years to give people confidence this is a state that uh, can make the tough choices and uh, build on the progress we've had over the last couple of years. So I think that was what we wanted to say, really as a shout out to members on both sides of the island legislature, a job well done. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I just had a couple of questions. One, um, Republicans would like to see the building open. Uh, they mentioned today in a press conference that they feel that that was a disadvantage for both sides. Clearly, there were some big issues in COVID and was closed for a reason. Will the building uh, be open going forward? I don't know for next week's uh, special session and from then on. Uh, I know the lobbyists were frustrated. They couldn't get into the lobby on occasion. Uh, but look, uh, as you know, I, I don't control that. That's a decision made by uh, the legislative leadership and the Speaker of the House. Um, uh, I think things worked pretty well. We did a lot more online. There were a lot of public hearings online. Uh, so certainly January, February, and March, I think um, appropriately the legislature uh, erred on the side of caution. Now, as you point out, our um, infection rate is much lower, uh, but maybe uh, just for another week or so, we should be cautious. I'll let them make up their mind. And the other thing with the budget, the, uh, the House Republican uh, minority leader said that uh, at the beginning of this process that there were many tax increases and they believe that their input uh, uh, and working with you and the, the Democrats helped get some of those taxes out. Is that true? Sure. I'm always happy to have people um, provide constructive solutions. And uh, we found a way to take care of the really key uh, priorities we had without raising taxes. And um, absolutely, uh, Vinny and Kevin reminded me how important that was on many occasions. All right. Thank you. And marijuana, does it matter to you if it gets passed next week or the week after or not? Will you be disappointed if something changes? Yeah, I will be. Um, you know, pass the bill. Let's go. Vote on it and pass it. We got you... Um, you know, the most comprehensive bill in the country uh, four months ago, a couple of hundred pages. We know um, how to do this on a safe, regulated basis for adults. We know how to decommercialize it, which is so important. And um, I think it's time to vote. And if you can't vote this week, vote early next week, but vote. And, and I, would, I would just add to what the governor Please. said, that the people of Connecticut have made their voices heard. Sixty. Six percent of our state uh, really wants this to happen, so we should do it for the people of our state. Thank you. News eight. Good afternoon. I'm wondering. Um, you men you mentioned pay for it in an appropriate way. Are you concerned at all about the implementer bill and things being put in there that you're not going to be happy about, as far as uh, money going over? what we can afford? Um, well, there are <clears throat> some automatic authorizations, and these can go out two years, five years, 10 years, that can tie the hands of a governor and future governors and make it more and more complicated to balance the budget. So I think it's really important that um, what we do, we go through the norm normal uh, budgetary process and, um, well, at the same time, give people confidence that so when it comes to um, housing, when it comes to brownfields, when it comes to the environment, we're ready to make the investments we need to keep people safe. Have you seen the language yet, Governor? No, I'm, um, I'm told that everybody wants to take a break today, so I think that's going to um, restart the negotiations tomorrow. On the actual implementer? Uh, I have not myself. I think uh, Melissa, they've been trading drafts back and forth with the appropriations. Um, uh, leaders, and I think the negotiations start tomorrow. Thank you. NBC Connecticut. Thanks, Max. Governor, uh, aside from the budget, what were some of the other wins or losses of this legislative session? Um, well, I'll start and then, um, you know, uh, pass it to Susan. But look, um, Christine, we came out of uh, a year from hell, and um, 
I think it was really important we came together in terms of our budget, in, in terms of ARPA, in terms of uh, bonding, that make sure that we take care of those who have been hardest hit by uh, COVID. Make sure that those urban communities, uh, in particular, black and brown people, their hardest hit get a chance to get back on their feet. Often these were folks least likely to get back to school for um, a variety of different reasons. So uh, I think in terms of the investments we're making to make sure uh, these folks and everybody gets a chance to get back on their feet, I'm proud of. And more broadly, we gotta get this uh, state moving again. We gotta get this state growing again. Let's face it, we have not been a, um, big job creator compared to uh, some of those Sunbelt states, uh, you know, going back a generation. And I think uh, this is a budget that starts to make the investments we need, including transportation and broadband and education that allow us to hit the ground running. Anything you want to add there, Susan? I would just say that this session was historic because of our equity focus. Um, literally all of the epidemics within the pandemic that we've seen in our state uh, were addressed, whether it's uh, mental health, opioid uh, addiction, domestic violence, and in healthcare, we've addressed, I think, in a very meaningful way. What about health care? Let's dive into that for a second. I mean, I would I would say that, you know, the federal government came in with, uh, you know, additional subsidies for those who purchased their insurance on the exchange and already received subsidies. There was no benchmarking. Um, there was no additional state subsidies for low income individuals. Did you accomplish what you wanted to in regards to health care? Well, I'll, I'll push back a little bit on that, uh, Christine. Um, you're right. Um, the uh, thanks to our help from uh, you know President Biden and Congress, um, we have enormous subsidies on the exchange, dramatically reducing the cost of health insurance, virtually to zero for families up to fifty thousand, cut in half for families up to uh, ninety thousand dollars a year in income. We put in place a, a wraparound Medicaid benefit that greatly reduces the co-pays and the deductibles for those families who otherwise couldn't be able to afford their health care. And I'd argue it's the biggest expansion of health care uh, this country has seen, certainly since Obamacare. Yeah, and I would just add um, to what the governor said, Christine, is that we are making uh, major investments in maternal health, uh, and we are expanding health care to bring on 40,000 additional working families. That's huge when you consider that right now we have about 130,000 uh, people on Access Health uh, Connecticut. So this is a, a big expansion of access to health care for families in our state. And we've also passed a uh, historic expansion to allow um, the children of immigrants from uh, babies to those who are eight years old to get access to health care. Um, and that's going to help thousands of kids. Thank you. The Hartford Current. Uh, thanks, Max. Uh, Governor, I, I just wanted to know exactly what you had been told on on uh, marijuana. In other words, we were hearing there was uh, a possible vote in the House on Wednesday the 16th. And also, uh, one of the things being discussed, and I wanted to know if, uh, what your opinion on was on it, to potentially take... Uh, the implementer and uh, marijuana and everything and roll it all into one bill. Uh, would you be in favor of something like that? Um, I got to tell you, Chris, I don't really have a strong point of view on that. I have a strong point of view. Do whatever it takes to uh, get this over the finish line. Uh, you've been talking about it for a decade in this state and around the country. We have, um, you know, red states and blue states are passing this and doing it on a, a very careful, regulated way. And I think uh, we're ready to do the same. And uh, if it's Wednesday, vote on Wednesday. Uh, also on another topic, a uh, legislative topic, the Tesla bill failed again. That's failed probably at least five times. Uh, what are your thoughts on the whole Tesla situation? Uh, I think um, status quo is pretty tough to change in this state. And uh, there are some very influential lobbyists here. Um, look. Uh, I believe strongly that our fleet is going to be more and more uh, electrified uh, over the next uh, 10, 15 years. I think that's really important. And I think being able to buy all the different all electric vehicles here in this state 
rather than forcing people to drive out of state, uh, is not the right way to go. It's come up before, it'll come up again, and eventually I think it'll pass. Okay, so in other words, you're, you're on the side of Tesla, in other words, that they should be able to sell, basically. I think they should be able to sell. Yeah, I think consumer choice is always a really positive thing for our economy. Thank you. The Associated Press. Thanks, Max. Good morning. Uh, Governor, I was wondering, uh, there was quite a bit of legislation that passed regarding nursing homes in light of the pandemic. Are you satisfied that what passed addresses the issues that were raised in the Mathematica report? Um, what I can tell you is I'm really satisfied that um, those frontline nurses who showed up every day at considerable risk, especially early on, as pointed out by the Mathematica report, uh, they got the raise they deserve. You know, I, I just talked to all the nursing home ombuds people. I, I wasn't quite sure who they were. They were the folks that had to double down and joined by the um, uh, National Guard do the inspections at these nursing homes. And some were really good at how they managed their way through PPE, how they managed their way through infections, how they managed their uh, way through COVID. Others were not so good. Uh, so I think some of the bills uh, begin to address this. Um, I'll give you a more specific answer when I have a better chance to read them, Sue. And looking forward, I know you've spoken about this before, where you think that we should maybe take, you know, do more of an investment into home care, uh, take, a, take a look at different models out there for elder care. Uh, do you think that some of the remaining ARPA money, the $400 million, should go toward that? I, I think there is talk of that. Uh, what, what do you foresee going ahead? Uh, should we stick with this model of nursing homes, or should we maybe take a use this opportunity to transform how older people live? I always like the opportunity to transform. I think we can um, always do better. Uh, I, I think we do have some um, ARPA money, the Rescue Act money. Um, I'd like to see some of that reserved for year three, just to make sure we have a smooth transition there. It's worth noting that in our deal with the nursing homes and the nurses, um, the nursing homes get a true up, I think it is for uh, nine months, a significant increase, helping them manage back to whatever um, the new norm is for them. But it means we're not gonna continue the status quo forever. We're not gonna continue that big raise forever. And at some point, Sue, you may see that nursing homes are more um, oriented towards acute care patients, where the nursing home operators and nurses would earn more. And those who are less acute would be more likely, as you just said, to be at home where you can take care of them, um, probably at a little less expense to the taxpayer and certainly a lot more comfort to grandma and grandpa. And Sue, I would just add to that, that we already have a program in Connecticut that we need to get the message out on. And that is a program where um, the family members who are caregiving to uh, seniors in their homes actually get paid and it's been shown by by all the research to be incredibly successful in keeping seniors in their own home and out of nursing homes and out of hospitals which is better for everybody and i think most people if you ask them would say they prefer that and so we just have to get the message out there that that program is already available in the state. We want more people in our state to know about it. Okay, great. Thank you both. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Thanks, Max. Hi, Governor. Hi, Governor. Um, Governor Lamont, um, without being too polite, can you describe the interaction with the Senate majority uh, over the issue of the capital gains and the uh, the increase in taxes on the, the highest incomes in the state and how that got ejected from the budget. I think I was pretty clear um, for a very long time, Ken, that um, A, we had the resources, um, uh, in part thanks to the American Rescue Plan, in part thanks to a lot of capital gains activity putting money into our um, coffers, in part due to the fact we have tens of thousands of families moving into the state of Connecticut who are now beginning to pay taxes. Uh, there was no need to raise taxes. 
And I also uh, thought you mentioned um, capital gains. Um, I thought it was a really dumb idea to um, – our capital gains, let's say, is 40 percent more than it is in Massachusetts now. Do you really think making it 90 percent more – almost double the cost was not going to impact our economic growth over a period of time? Okay, well, I'll take that as the level of uh, not being polite about it. Um, is there anything in particular that you would be worried about showing up in the implementer? Yes, um, paying for long-term expenses with short-term money. I think that's a bad policy. <laughs> um, and in the uh, waning minutes, uh, the proposal to make um, – a particular flatbread with toppings on it, the state food failed in the Senate. Um, is that going to affect your uh, your relationship with the General Assembly? <laughs> hey, everybody knows we got the best pizza in the world. I don't need the state Senate to tell me that. <laughs> Thanks, Governor. Amen. Amen. And no disrespect to lobster rolls, cider, craft beer. Oh, yeah. Okay. You're a politician. Thank you, Governor. <laughs> Bye. See you, Kim. The Day of New London. Hi, everyone. Uh, Governor, are there any bills in particular, aside from marijuana, that you hope get attention in the special session? Uh, well, I remember that the Transportation Climate Initiative um, is still something that's uh, important. If you uh, care about climate, if you care about the environment, and you want to discourage big tractor-trailer trucks um, and cars from uh, you know, doing more and more driving uh, on our roads. So I think um, that's something we'd like to look at. Okay, so you do see that coming up? I didn't say that. You said, what would I like to see? And uh, that's something I wouldn't mind seeing. I think uh, we have a chance to revisit it. Why not? Thank you. The Waterbury Republican American. Yeah, I'd like to, to pick up on that question. Are you instructing Secretary McCall and Chief of Staff Mounds to seek inclusion of the TCIP in the budget implementer? Uh, I don't think I'd put it that way, Paul. Um, really, it's up to uh, the legislative leadership. But I heard uh, Matt Ritter say the other day, the Speaker of the House, we have a little more time. When you have a little more time, maybe it's an opportunity to take a second look at some bills that didn't get the attention they deserved during the regular session. And I'd put TCI right in that list. Well, speaking of that list, um, you know, we dealt last year with uh, a long list of bills that uh, folks wanted to see brought up in a special session. I think we were, what, up to more than 70. So what will your role be, your office's role be, in either limiting or expanding or, or, or basically setting setting the agenda? I mean, what are, you know, do you want, you know, this is going to be, I guess, a single bill, and it's going to be the potential to be a, a, a big Christmas tree. Uh, yeah, I don't want any Christmas trees, and we're not having a whole, um, you know, second round. Um, it does seem to me that, um, you know, marijuana started some months ago. It's time to finish that on a timely basis in the special session. TCI, we got a long way there, but not all the way. Maybe that's something people will take a second look at. But we don't need any Christmas trees. Uh, it's it's summertime. Okay. And I'd like to follow up on on Christine's uh, earlier question. It'll be, I guess, the last one for me. Um, you know, we're we're hearing a lot of of what you consider to be the, the the triumphs of the session. What were some of the disappointments for you? What bills uh, outside of TCI uh, that you and your office were looking to get done that uh, weren't able to get through uh, the legislature. I would have been more aggressive on a broadband. I think they uh, took a lot of the uh, guts out of that bill. Um, I come out of that world. I know how um, complicated it can be to get your fiber optic cable on a pole. We had some um, small things like that that would make a difference. I think my broadest concern is we make sure we have a, um, a budget and a bond bill and an implementer that are fiscally responsible, not just for the next two years. I feel very confident about the next two years. I know we have a three-plus billion dollar rainy day fund, but that does not cover all myriad of sins. So I want to make sure we have a budget that's built to last. 
Okay, thank you very much. The Connecticut Mirror. Thanks, Max. Uh, Governor Lamont, I'd like to revisit Ken Dixon's non-pizza question. Um, let, me, let me try phrasing it this way. Do you believe that the state and municipal tax systems that we have right now are relatively fair? Or do you think, as some studies argue, they disproportionately lean heaviest on the middle class? I think the uh, tax system, um, especially the over-reliance on the property tax, uh, Ken, uh, hits the, the middle class hardest. And I have to take that fact and couple that with the fact that we're a state that really hasn't had any net new jobs uh, over the last 30 years, and i got to make sure we stay competitive and can grow because a growing economy is one of the best ways to hold down um, uh, taxes in general and property tax in particular. I referred earlier to the fact that you have a lot of our cities beginning to lower their property tax or at least holding the line in part because their economic pie is growing, their um, grand list is growing. Okay, well, starting with that premise then that it, it does lean a little heavier on the middle class or somewhat heavier on the middle class. Um, Representative Scanlon um, tried to attack that problem this year. It probably didn't get all the attention from the media it, it deserved, but it would have, depending on how you adjust for inflation, amounted to the single largest state income tax cut for the middle class. You wanted to create a child tax credit. Um, one of your arguments was in, in looking toward budget stability was we've got a federal expansion of the child tax credit, at least for one year. Um, do you think, though, that the extra $1,000 a child that the federal government at least has promised only for one year, but potentially longer, is enough to redress the imbalances? In other words, does that $1,000 per child extra, is that enough to make our tax system good? So the middle class is Yeah, whole. I mean, yeah, Sean is great. We, we talked about this a lot. And um, and you're right. We've had the biggest increase in the child ta tax credit, you know, thanks to uh, President Biden, um, you know, in, in a very long time, $3,600 uh, per child. You got three kids under the age of five. That 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 is significant. And uh, if that does not get continued, uh, Keith, we'll have to take a, a look and how do we uh, think about this. But remember, for every tax cut or spending increase, it's going to be balanced on the other side with a, a tax increase or um, another cut. And you have to come up with the right balance there. And again, I'm really focused a lot on getting this economy growing again, but growing in a way that uh, makes sure that nobody's left behind. Well, just to, to quickly finish this point off, your, your former aide, Lisa Tepper Bates, says 38% of Connecticut households can't make enough to cover a basic survival budget. And for a lot of households, they need to make tens of thousands of dollars more a year to get to that threshold. With that context, do you still think an extra $1,000 per child is enough to cover the middle class? Well, look, we can have this debate, but that uh, basic survival threshold, the Alice uh, number is a $90,000, I think, for a, a family of four. So um, it's, um, the good news is people's salaries are rising. The biggest expansion of childcare ever, that saves um, that parent an awful lot of money. What we're doing to make uh, health care more affordable, that saves you thousands of dollars. What we're doing for a, a debt-free community college, that saves you thousands of dollars. So there are a lot of ways we are working to make Connecticut much more affordable for our middle class. Okay, one last question, Governor, and it's not on the middle class. I should ask Susan um, one. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, if, if Governor Bicewitz wants to jump in on this, that's fine. Um, both TCI and the prescription drug proposal were, were bipartisan pitches uh, that you had pushed with Governor Baker. What do you think happened this session with those? I think the lobbyists are very powerful. Let's face it, the pharmaceutical lobby is the biggest lobby in the country. And I did have a... a, a plan that would hold down uh, the increasing costs of pharmaceuticals. If you want to long-term reduce the price of health care in the state, holding down those costs is important. But that was a tough one. We didn't get that done. And let's face it, the um, oil lobby and the, the gas station guys are pretty powerful. Um, I talked to Charlie Baker quite a bit about that. Um, but that's okay. Uh, you live to fight another day.
And, and Keith, I would just add to what the governor said that we had strong bipartisan support on some of the biggest issues that we tackled, like the budget, to have 31 votes in the state Senate for a budget and a huge number in the House is really historic and transformative. Same with gaming, same with the unemployment um, trust fund that, that passed unanimously, broadband. There were so many issues where there was very strong bipartisan support. Were there a couple of things we didn't get that we still want to work on? Um, of course. Thank you. Connecticut Public Media. I'm sorry if I missed this earlier, but wondering if you're planning on signing three of the major criminal justice bills, the clean slate, solitary confinement, and free prison phone calls. I'm certainly going to uh, sign clean slate uh, as soon as I'm done with this um, you know, press briefing. Uh, the other two I've got to take a look at. They're coming across my desk very soon. And then what about um, the NIL bill? Uh, which is that again? NCAA um, allowing the athletes to receive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, look, I, I think that cat's out of the bag. You're seeing uh, other states are doing this. Um, I think we're going to be signing that as well. A, it allows UConn and our other universities to compete with universities around the country. I think they're doing it in a relatively responsible way. And last question, do you plan on vetoing any bills? Uh, let me get back to you on that. CT News Junkie. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, I, uh, real quick, I just wanted to try to pin you down on the TCI issue again. Uh, it sounds to me like you're saying that you, um, you're you not going to push the legislature to take it up in the special session, but you but you hope that they do. Is that uh, the right characterization? No, of I don't think so. I mean, I, I've talked to everybody. I said I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's the right thing to do for the state. I think it's the right thing to do for our kids. I think um, it's, uh, it's a small fee on, um, you know, petroleum wholesalers. I, I think it makes sense. I'm doing that with Charlie Baker and Rhode Island, and we had other states ready to follow. Uh, that said, um, if the legislature doesn't want to take it up, uh, that's their call, but I'm pushing. Okay. Thank you. CT Examiner. Hi, Governor. I'm just going to go back to broadband for a second. I'd like to hear um, a little bit more of your reaction, particularly to the fact that a lot of the regulatory capabilities that Pure would have had are now taken out of this bill. And um, do you still plan on supporting it? Oh, yeah, I still plan on supporting it. It's a uh, step in the right direction. It's a sort of a two foot step, not a full yard, but uh, we're making progress. You know, I never thought I'd say this because I come out of telecommunications, but um, the idea that they're totally unregulated, that they don't have an obligation to build out over a period of time so that nobody's left behind, I think there are some pieces of this that we uh, should revisit. Okay. And um, there's a couple of labor-related bills that came out that were pretty uh, contentious. I'm thinking particularly of the bill that requires workplaces to rehire based on seniority for certain laid-off workers. Um, do you have thoughts on that, or do you plan on signing that? Um, uh, per Jonathan, it's been um, it's gone through a couple of iterations, so let me take a look at it. But I do understand uh, the philosophy behind it, which is um, you were gainfully employed at a, uh, a good business, and due to no fault of your own, due to COVID, you got laid off. And within a limited period of time, when they start rehiring, should you rehire um, uh, based on seniority? I can th see unless there's a real need for one type of uh, work or not another, it makes some sense to me. Thank you. And I'll just say on that, um, that second iteration of hiring laid off workers bills was done, I think um, it got changed significantly in the House and it came up to the Senate in the last hour or so. Uh, so we still need some time to take a look at what happened um, in the House and what the Senate ended up passing. All right, Susan, I think I'm getting the signal here. So um, thanks to you for joining us. We've been doing this for a while and um, 
again, my hat's off to the legislature. My hat's off to uh, Martin Looney and Kevin Kelly and Vin Candelora, Speaker of the House, Matt Ritter, and uh, all the folks who have been in this uh, building, you know, round the clock in many cases for uh, days and days and days. Um, thank you for what you do on behalf of the people of Connecticut. Thank you for getting um, a good budget passed on time on a bipartisan basis. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Thank you.